What's good, I'm Matt Jumper and I've built a ton of websites in Framer, including some pretty large size ones. And I'm gonna share with you what my process looks like going from Figma to Framer. I'm gonna break down each of these items, but high level, there are three things that I do when I get started. The first is establish a layout system. The second is create styles. And third is start building. And in that third one, by the way, start building section, I'm going to get into the Figma to Framer plugin, um, my thoughts on it and why I don't always use it. So let's get started and dive into the first one, establishing a layout system. Okay, so I have my Figma file here, and this is actually for a site called Bark, which I've built for the Framer Masterclass with Flux Academy, which I just finished recording. So keep an eye out for that. This first section here is about establishing a layout system, which is gonna create consistency in your layouts, which is the key to creating cohesive and just like polished websites, because things are consistent. So when you're building it out, um, if you've built out all these pages, um, I've kind of assumed that you would have uh, had consistency in mind and have established already maybe what some outside padding is, what the gap is between sections, stuff like that. Um, if you haven't, I would just suggest doing that. Um, but even if you have, um, what I've gone and, and done is actually created a spacing document here. And this is just me simply writing out, here are the margins for desktop, tablet, and mobile. So I'm actually considering the different responsive breakpoints. Here's the max width of the content. Here's the vertical padding, and again, broken down by desktop, tablet, and phone. And the vertical padding being the spacing um, above and below each section, um, as well as gaps. So like the spacing between content, right? So we have extra small, that's 16, up to small, 24, medium, 48, large, extra large. Um, and this gap can get um, bigger and bigger. And I just have these um, numbers to choose from. So I'm not just randomly choosing Oh, I'm going to do 100 or I'm going to do 120. I have these numbers to choose from. So that's going to create consistency. And you can bring this into Framer if you want to. But if you have your Figma file, there's not really any need to import it into Framer unless you're working with um, a team or the if you're delivering a project to a client, maybe the client would like to see that if they're making updates themselves, depending on what that looks like. Uh, that's totally up to you and what that relationship is. Um, so once you have all of this stuff documented for like the spacing, you also want to consider other stuff like, um, a corner radius, right? Cause this is also another element that keeps things consistent and you can have multiple, you can have four pixels of the extra small, then you get up to eight pixels and then 16, but on your site, you're never going to see anything outside of these numbers. This just helps you again, remain consistent and doing this upfront is a lot easier than trying to retrofit things at the end. Um, so just recommend documenting in the beginning. And a great way to make sure that you are remaining consistent and actually kind of abiding by these numbers is to use guides. So in Figma, we have these, you can turn them on by control G. And this is just a quick way to make sure that, you know, your outside, outside padding is consistent and you're following it. Um, the spacing, just a quick gut check to be like, okay, the, the gap here is actually following the, um, the gaps that we have in the columns, but so we have different values here. So you don't need to, uh, abide by the guides hundred percent. It's just a guide, right? Um, so you could break this, it's not a big deal. It's just a tool to help you see if you're um, breaking anywhere that you shouldn't be. So we can do this in Framer um, by opening the desktop here. And we can add guides by going to the Framer logo and going file, uh, sorry, view, show guides. Same thing, control G. And you could just set this up in the same way. So you can do a 12 column layout and I always, um, do the alignment to stretch that way the width of the columns is always um, going to change based off your screen size uh, but it's the gap in the margin that is going to be consistent so the gap is the space between the columns so we can make that 24 and the margin would be um, we documented which was 64 i believe yep and then um, after this the next thing you want to do is you can set up your actual breakpoints so we have our desktop at 1200. Um, I usually just follow the same, uh, the default framer breakpoints. So I can just hit breakpoint and open up tablet that's at um, 810 and phone at 390. Um, you don't have to do this. You could set up your own, um, but it's good to do this upfront. So then you can, um, as you make new pages, you're inheriting that same breakpoint and not having to, again, retrofit all the stuff after. You'll notice that the guides here um, are getting really skinny on the phone. Um, that's because we didn't change it per breakpoint. So just like I said, with the um, margins, we have 64 desktops. So tablet, we can change it now to 32. 
So we can click on the guides here and the margin would be 32. And even the, the count here, we could drop this down to say six. And then for the phone, we said it was a 24 outside margin and we can drop this down to six or even three columns and the gap we can leave at 24, that's fine. Um, but now this is just a quick way for us to just make sure all the content is at least um, sitting where it needs to be. All right, number two is create styles. So creating color, text, and link styles up front will make it easier to stay organized and also help speed up the build process a lot. The first thing we can look at is color. So I have in Figma documented all of the color styles that I'm using and set up these styles in Figma as well. Um, I can kind of walk you through um, the first step, which is like figuring out a naming convention and like a grouping convention. So I have um, kind of two approaches here. One is for white and black. Um, I've just grouped these and these are basically by percentage because I have white um, at 100%, 48, 24, and 12, and black at 140 and eight. The reason why I'm using percentages here is because the background colors in this project sometimes change. And instead of having different, like hundred different shades of gray that are like to each of these colors, like green, purple, pink, orange, um, we can just use white and black at different opacities. That way it takes in the color from behind it. So because of the opacities, I just like to name it at the, um, the number of the opacity with the percentage beside it. Um, cause I can visually just understand what that is going to look like. With the other colors, so we have like charcoal, blue, beige, green, purple, pink, orange. All of these are following a bit of a different uh, naming convention. And this is following the Tailwind CSS colors. Um, the idea there is basically just that the um, number here on a scale from 100 to 900 is just a scale of how light or dark the color is. So again, just seeing that number, seeing green 500, I can get an idea of how dark that is. Um, and also it's the equivalent to purple 500, pink 500, orange 500, et cetera. Um, it's just an easy way to um, understand what the color is gonna look like without actually visually seeing it. So you can take these colors here. Um, and if you haven't set this up in Figma, that's totally fine. Um, just take all the colors that you have in your file and you can just go into Framer and go to assets, go to styles and hit plus and we can do a color style and you know, you can name it if this is uh, pink 500, give it that name, copy the um, hex code here. Whoops. Into the hex code. Um, and then you can also at this point, if you have dark and light mode, you can put it here um, and change that hex code based off dark and light mode. You can hit create and you just do this for every color that you have. That way when you are using any color, it's all gonna be consistent and this is all out of the way. Next thing would be creating textiles. So <laughs> this is a lot here, I know. Um, I've gone out of my way to actually do this in Figma just to say, um, stay super organized and make it easier for when I'm importing into Framer. I wouldn't expect uh, many people to actually go through all this trouble, um, but a similar thing, you could just do it where you're just extracting all the textiles or the text elements from Figma and every time you see a new one, you just make an, um, a style in Framer. So I'll walk you through just how I have this set up in this document. Um, I just have it broken down by name, the font size, the um, font weight, the line height, the letter spacing, and the font. And then also broken down by H1, H2, H3, and P. So in Framer, you would just do the same thing and do a new style and a text style. And let's say it's the H1. Um, I can click on this and we can set this up. So set it to 120, um, regular 100% line. Uh, so here, the size here is 120, 100%. And the letter was minus four, which is already set up here. Um, and then why I like to do the colors first is because you can actually set default colors for the text styles. So now I can set this to say pink 500. Um, and then we can you know, adjust whatever other properties we need to. And at this point too, it's also good to um, establish if you are gonna use responsive type and actually have this um, textile reduce or increase in font size as you get to the different breakpoints, you can do this. Where now um, the type on the, uh, the type is large and we can set the min width. And this is basically just tying itself to the breakpoints that we set up. We can change it now. So 120, it automatically jumped down to 96 and 77, so we can change this value to you know 32, um, whatever you want. So it's good to do this upfront, and then you can always make adjustments on the fly, um, but the more document, the better. 
And the font, I actually have a custom font for the site, so it's good to get that out of the way up front as well. We can upload the font here under custom and select it. And we just have to do this once. Now when we make new textiles, um, we have this option to choose from. The last thing is link styles as well. So if you have um, text links anywhere, you want to create this new style. And again, after you've set your colors up, you can do, you know, say it's pink 500 and you can basically just set the text de decoration, add the transition, um, change the hover state or whatever you want to do. Um, just another thing to get out of the way up front. All right. And lastly, time to start building. So Figma to Framer, the plugin, um, this is a kind of topic and question that we get a lot. You know, is it worth it? Um, should I use it? What do, you know, the experts use? Um, what, what should I look out for? In my opinion, um, it's really only worth it if you are setting up your Figma files using auto layout and like structuring them in the same way that you plan on building them in Framer. But even then, sometimes some elements don't actually import perfectly and don't carry those properties. Let me show you um, this card in Figma. This is actually built the exact same way that I'd build it in Framer. So I have a card here, which is, I mean, I'll call it a stack for Framer's sake. Um, and the width is set to fill and the height is set to fixed at 400. There's an icon in here, and this is a frame with the background applied to it, a corner radius, and then an icon inside, which is a vector icon. And then underneath this, we have text, which is in its own stack. And this text is set to fill. And the text inside is also set to fill and the height set to hug, which is fit in Framer. So this ideally would carry over and like carry all of those properties with it. So let's see what happens. Um, I can open up the Figma to HTML Framer plugin and you'll see it says copy five layers, paste in Framer. So we can do this. Um, let's go to the desktop frame here and I'm gonna make this a layout just so we can see the responsiveness of it. Um, and I'm gonna hit paste, so Command V and Right away, um, a couple things stand out to me. One is the card itself actually worked. It's set to fill and the height is set to 400, that, that's fine. But this text here was supposed to fill the card as well. Um, I'm clicking on it and the width is set to 230 fixed, which in Figma is 230, but it's set to fill, but it's just, that's like the, the size that I landed at. So unfortunately I have to take these two text layers and set them to fill. And everything else I think looks okay. I mean, text here is hundred percent relative, um, which I'll probably end up switching to fill in this scenario. It's the same thing, but in other scenarios it might not be. Um, and then the icon actually got imported as one graphic. Um, so it's like the circle and the icon are one. I can double click this and it's now like a, a framer graphic and I can keep clicking into it and I can get it, but this isn't really what I wanted. Um, because I was using uh, an icon library, I'm probably just going to um, rebuild this inside of Framer. So I'll probably delete this icon here and use this stuff. Um, with this text, I would then have to apply a style to it. Even if a style was applied in, in Figma, those don't carry over. Um, so I have to apply the style and then you'll see like this font here is missing. Um, so I'd have to apply that style as well. And same thing with the color. Um, the style, the color will come um, kind of packed with it, but if that color was unique, then we'd have to set that again. Um, so you can see it's not perfect, but it's like, it works. Um, the other thing to consider, the small kind of nuance thing is like, if I change this headline, um, I call it new headline, the text, uh, the layer name here didn't change. It's still the old understand your dog because the, the name actually gets imported as the, the text. Um, it doesn't just come as like the default uh, text layer. So if I delete it and for text that doesn't change, I have to delete it once and then delete it again. And now it's dynamic. So if I call this new copy, it actually updates here. That's a super small thing, not a big deal. Um, but for somebody that likes their layers clean and named properly, um, that could be a bit confusing if you're like have a bunch of layers and then you see text here and you're like, oh, that's not the copy I'm trying to get to, but it is, it's just named wrong. Um, Cause it, you're not manually naming it, right? So it's like very deceiving. So that's my two cents on the Figma to Framer plugin. And I can just delete this kind of blank slate again. Um, once I start building, I might use the Figma to Framer plugin, probably not. 
Um, but I would just start from the top bottom and go section by section. Um, but the thing is, I'm not gonna like try to perfect each section as I do it. Um, as a designer, I often want to go wide and not like super deep because um, there's a lot of like details and nuances and like subtle things like animations and like there's little consistencies that you want to clean up at the end. Um, so it's easier to kind of leave those things till the last, like either like in the beginning or at the end and then like do a final sweep because you're gonna do a sweep anyways to like go through all the elements. Um, so I like not to get caught up in the details while I'm building the site like from top to bottom and then go back at the end and like fine tune it. Um, that's just my personal approach. There's no right or wrong way to do it. I'm just sharing my process. Um, and the other thing to consider when building out um, your site, something to help with consistency as well as speed is creating reusable components anytime you make something that is or that can be reused. So, you know, a button, um, even something as simple as like a divider, like a dividing line, I'll make that a component. That way, if I decide, hey, dividing lines um, should be two pixels and black at 8%, and then I'm like, you know what? It's gonna be one pixel at 6%. That can just change that globally and not have to go back and tediously update all those dividers. All right, so that's my Figma to framework process, and I hope you found this insightful and can leverage some of this um, into your own process. If you wanna see some more framework content, drop a comment below and let me know what. And of course, keep an eye out for that Flux Framework Masterclass dropping soon.